joining today's SDG Dialogue, the second in a series of discussions that ADB is having with global leaders and senior management to reflect on opportunities to amplify our contributions to attainment of the SDGs in Asia and the Pacific. By way of introduction, I'm Smita Nakuda. I work in the Strategy, Policy and Partnerships Department of the ADB and serve, which, and serve as the bank's focal point on the SDGs. I lead this area of work and I get to moderate this series. The imperative to create new incentives to direct private investment to support the SDGs has never been clearer. The COVID-19 pandemic has threatened progress on the SDGs across all countries and added to existing financing gaps for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We all know that achieving the SDGs will require steering private capital towards investments that can advance progress on the goals. The good news is that private sector interest and focus on SDG-aligned investment has surged. This week, governments are gathering to report on their progress in implementing this ambitious agenda at the high-level political forum on the SDGs in New York. It seems timely that as the Asian Development Bank, we're taking today to focus on opportunities to mobilize the financing that it will take to realize these ambitions in our region. We're glad to have a panel of people leading this agenda join us to discuss the opportunities and challenges that our region faces. Let me turn first to Emily Woodland, who is the Head of Sustainable Investing and Managing Director of BlackRock Asia Pacific. BlackRock has made a lot of headlines recently for pushing the envelope when it comes to ensuring private investments advance the public goods and have purpose, particularly on issues such as climate change. We'd love to hear a little more from you about the drivers of BlackRock's growing focus on sustainable investment and how this is manifesting in your strategies in Asia and the Pacific, and in particular, how the sustainable development goals are adding value to these efforts. Thanks so much for joining us, Emily. Thanks for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'll do um, is I'll start with how we think about sustainability more broadly, um, and then I'll drill it down to how we're thinking about the SDGs more specifically. So on sustainability, BlackRock's strategy is focused on long-term value creation. Uh, we believe we're on the cusp of a transformational change towards sustainability. Um, at BlackRock, we define sustainable investing as the combination of traditional investment approaches with environmental, social and governance or ESG insights to mitigate risk and enhance long term returns. Now, whereas sustainable investing was historically considered to be an external consideration to the portfolio and it focused on values alignment or reduction of harm, there's now increasing awareness in the market that material ESG factors can be tied to a company's long term performance. And that means investors no longer need to choose between purpose and performance. So at BlackRock, we've always focused on helping our clients try to reach their long term investment goals by providing resilient, well constructed portfolios. And this duty cemented our commitment uh, in 2020 to adopting sustainability as the new standard for investing. So we have two main theses when it comes to sustainability. First of all, we believe that sustainability related data provides an increasingly important set of tools to help us un identify unpriced risks and opportunities within our portfolios. And therefore, we believe that sustainability and climate integrated portfolios can provide better risk adjusted returns to our investors over the long term. And in turn, that helps our clients build more resilient portfolios over the long term. And secondly, we believe there will be a tectonic shift towards sustainable investing. So in other words, market factors will accelerate a reallocation of capital towards issuers and assets that have positive sustainability characteristics and away from negative ones. And this in turn will impact valuations. This is why we're working hard to support our clients in adjusting and preparing for this reallocation of capital. But we have to think that not all ESG factors will be relevant to each company. So we also promote this philosophy based on a concept of materiality. So this means ESG factors that have the potential to meaningly, meaningfully impact a company's bottom line or its valuation in the marketplace. And, and these are going to differ from one company and one industry to the next. So the course of 2020 and 21, we were focused on two main structural themes driving this change. Uh, first of all, we're quite focused on climate change specifically because we believe that climate change risk is investment risk, um, but also that the climate transition presents a historic investment opportunity. Um, and that's why we're working hard to expand our breadth and depth of climate investment options and tools in particular, um, as well as making our broader commitments um, to the public. As, as regards to the part that BlackRock can play in this transition. Secondly, we think about stakeholder capitalism. Um, and for example, a climate transition is one that is just, equitable, and it includes all stakeholders. 
So being connected to all stakeholders, which means establishing trust and acting with purpose, enables a company to properly understand and respond to the changes that are happening in the world. And last year gave us just a, a small taster of this. Um, we saw that across industries, companies that had strong ESG profiles and those that really considered their stakeholders were actually more resilient to the shocks and uncertainty we saw last year than the peers with lower ESG profiles. So it gives you an idea of our overall sustainability philosophy. Um, in terms of how that manifests in our investment strategies, look, we, we completely appreciate that sustainable investing is not a one size fits all concept. Um, and clients have different appetites for the depth of sustainability integration, things like tracking error, alpha targets, and so on across their portfolios. So we try and offer a spectrum of choices across our sustainable investing platform that cater to different needs. So you can think about how you express those views in different ways. Some people think about just replacing their traditional core exposures with sustainable building blocks. Some people will look to express a view on particular structural or environmental trends. Um, and, and, and some will actually seek to create positive and measurable impact with their investments. So that leads me nicely into how we then think about the SDGs more specifically. Um, this is particularly timely for us, actually, because um, the Black Rock Sustainable Investing Research Team just published a report on how we look at SDGs on the 1st of July. So it's, it's, it's hot off the press. Um, I'll, I'll, I won't do it justice if I try to go through it in detail, but the main premise is that companies in Asia that understand their overall impact on the environment and society, and they properly align their business and operations with the sustainable transition, they'll have the potential to become market leaders. And those that fail to adapt will likely be facing into more pressure from regulators and things like operational issues and reputational re repercussions of total inaction. So actually the breadth of the SDGs encompasses all of these different dimensions. But first we have to take a little step back because we recognize that the SDGs were actually originally designed for governments and policymakers and not really for investors. And this is actually something that many people in the finance world have grappled with a little bit. Um, so from the perspective of an investment manager, the SDGs are not necessarily great metrics of financial materiality just by themselves. Um, and so the SDGs become meaningful and impactful to us when they're paired with a clear investment framework, i.e. we're linking the SDGs to a clear investment case. So our latest piece of research, research attempts to do just that. Um, and we unveiled quite a significant overlap between the SDGs and the indicators that are material to a company's long-term financial performance. So we mapped the SASB, Financially Material Sustainability Indicators, to the um, SDG country indicators. We actually found about a 70% match across the two sets. Um, and this was particularly high in um, the SASB Environment, Business Model and Innovation, and the Human Capital categories. And they directly translate to things like climate change, um, responsible production and consumption, the sustainable construction and the waste management SDGs. So th what this means is how a company manages things like its use of water resources or the energy it consumes or its duty of care towards its workforce. These are all factors that are not only material to company performance, but they also have the potential to advance or detract from the world's progress on the SDGs. So then if I bring this back to how we actually use that to invest, um, we find that the SDGs can be mapped to deliver client value for clients in two main ways. First of all, we look at thematic or impact investments that specifically look to actually align with or even advance the SDGs. So really honing in on those business opportunities that are created by products and services that provide a positive contribution. Um, and then we also think a little more broadly um, about ESG focused strategies that benefit from the global transition towards the goals, using that as a lens that provides additional investment insight. So the SDGs can actually provide a framework for assessing company exposure to shifts in the regulatory or operational or reputational financial landscape. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, those can actually, those risks can be material to long-term financial performance. So for us, they offer information that could be valuable. Um, so we're developing investment solutions that integrate these considerations across all asset classes, either very targeted or more broad, as I said, and we're also providing our investment teams with the internally developed tools to help them integrate those SDGs into their investment processes and their solutions. 
Um, and one other factor to be considered there is that our stewardship team has also managed mapped its engagement priorities to the UN SDGs. So it looks to prioritize engagements to enhance corporate disclosures and awareness on the topics that matter most for companies, their long-term financial prospects, but also for the achievement of these goals. Uh, so that reflects on the strong alignment between both those goals and our vision of long-term economic sustainability. And, and you can see the results of this work in, in the publicly disclosed uh, stewardship reports that we have on our website. So I'll stop there. Um, I could talk about this all day, um, but that gives you a broad overview of what we're doing here at BlackRock at the moment. Fantastic, Emily. Thanks so much for that overview of the approach that BlackRock has been taking as this agenda has evolved. Let me turn now to Naina Batra, who is CEO and Chair of the Asian Venture Philanthropies Network. For those who may not be familiar with it, the network that she leads has grown to over 600 members that represent the ecosystem of social investors. Naina, as you know well from the growth that you've observed in your own network, a diversity of investors in our region are increasingly focused on environmental and social returns. Can you reflect a little bit on how these issues have evolved and where you see the opportunities to scale up and mainstream these considerations with the partners that you work with? Uh, thank you, Smita, and thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to join this discussion. It's interesting to come after Emily because Emily spoke about uh, you know, BlackRock's investments from a corporate perspective, and AVPN is a, is a network of funders and, and social investors. So what we have found is, is sort of also uh, in line with what I think uh, Emily has, has talked about in, in her opening statement. So I think there is a lot more interest to align financial returns with social impact, uh, which we are finding is leading to a greater openness to learn from um, pioneers amongst mainstream investors uh, and corporate professionals. So there were a few family offices initially who were sort of fresh off the block to look at aligning sustainability, to look at aligning SDGs in their own investments. And, and I, one of the things I, I can share with you is that uh, we just completed um, a fellowship program on impact investing for, um, for family offices, for uh, early stage impact investors. And it was interesting because the, the program was completely sold out. And uh, we are launching a second one, uh, which, which is in partnership with, uh, with our Africa network. And both seem to be uh, you know, getting a lot of interest showing that investors uh, family offices especially are looking at expanding their portfolio through an impact lens, through an SDG lens. So I think that's that's one point that I would like to make. The other one is, you know, again, building on what Emily said, is that we are also finding that corporates are moving beyond sort of looking at traditional CSR when they address the SDGs and to look at how they can integrate sustainability in their core businesses. So, for example, if you look at uh, Cargill, a large uh, multinational. It's looking at how, you know, helping to grow small to old, old farmers and connecting, connecting them to broader and wider markets. And that's being much more interesting to investors when they look at where they put in, uh, you know, where do, what, what kinds of corporates they put in, in their investment portfolio. Finally, I think what is interesting is that there is a greater openness to collaboration. And you know, if if we are really to look at uh, integrating SDG as in terms of uh, you know uh, as a centerpiece of your investment strategy, it's important to look at how do you how do you collaborate and how do you have collaboration. And sometimes you look at successful collaborations that often remain you know on on the plane of bilateral, project driven, and non formal commitments. But we are we are starting to see far more sophisticated collaborative models emerging, especially with looking at achieving SDGs through investment. And uh, we're finding that where corporates are coming together, not just uh, in terms, as I said, not just in terms of uh, their CSR, but in terms of also looking at pooling their, their philanthropic dollars. So we've, we launched uh, Asia's first uh, philanthropic uh, pooled fund which is looking at uh, COVID recovery across four Southeast Asian countries. And we had uh, six corporates actually that came together to pool more than two and a half million dollars to look at achieving the SDGs as far as healthcare is concerned uh, in terms of investing in, uh, in sort of enterprises working in this area in Southeast Asia. So I would say a lot more investor interest in terms of uh, looking at aligning the SDGs across their portfolio. But again, one has to take a portfolio approach. So um, I think having 
a more alignment in terms of SDG measurement with ESG measurement, with mainstream accounting measurement is going to help investors to really pick and choose how they um, you know, incorporate this into their portfolio. And until we do that, we're not going to see uh, uh, you know, sort of a larger uh, integration of SDG goals with, with investment appetite. Thanks a lot for that, Naina. Um, let me turn now to Suzanne Gaburi. Um, Suzanne, PSOD, our private sector operations, are on the front lines of ADB's efforts to scale up financing for the SDGs. Could you reflect a little bit on how ADB's approach to this has evolved, and in particular, the complementary role of our public and private sector engagement in this context? Thank you, uh, Smita. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I was going to say good evening uh, and good morning from Montreal, everyone. I guess, you know, it's a lot of these conferences were, were spanning the globe here. And I really appreciate being part of this conversation because I've been working in the private side of development finance for, for some time now. And I think that this topic is particularly important uh, and to, to take advantage of the events that are going on around us. Um, and I think that, you know, part of this is that we need to also reflect of, of the current environment in which we're working because, um, we're, we're hopefully in a recovery environment, we're a recovery period of time, and this requires a lot of, uh, uh, you know, mobilizing of public and private sector capital. Because even before the pandemic, you know, achieving the sustainable development goals was proving to be a challenge uh, globally, just because of the sheer scale and the amount of investment that's required. Um, you know, I, just to quote something from the United Nations from a little while ago uh, about, you know, they were talking that five to seven trillion dollars annually was needed to to fund the SDGs and and of this, you know, some 50% needs to come from the private sector. And I think this is even more important now as national budgets have become, you know, a little bit constrained in, 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 the, in the response to the pandemic. And as a consequence, you know, we need to step up to the plate. So achieving the SDGs is really at the heart of what ADB's uh, Strategy 2030 is about. It focuses uh, on the continued expansion of uh, ADB's private sector operations with the idea that we're going to reach one third of total, total operations by 2024 um, by looking at development impact as a key driver in these uh, op in the operations. And, and through this, you know, for our growing private sector, we continue to evolve and to optimize our overall strategy to deliver the SDGs uh, and to adapt to climate imperatives to deliver on the Paris Agreement, which is, you know, again, uh, given the, the auspicious um, week this is, you know, with the discussions that are going on also for COP26, which is also coming up. And we put development impact, which is really at the center of our projects and, and, in, and part of our investment toolkit, and particularly as we report on the results. And as a part of this, you know, our private sector operations are looking at, or ha, are, are, actually are implementing, <clears throat> pardon me, um, an ex-ante development framework. So this goes to a little bit to some of the things that uh, uh, Emily has also mentioned about measuring and, and, you know, looking at the types of investments you're doing from the very start. And so the, the part of the idea of this uh, framework is that it's an end-to-end -end system which uh, that includes the results monitoring um, uh, under implementation, including at the end of this. So you want to make sure that you know part of these discussions, which are is the tension between impact versus return. You know we believe that you can have both, but you need to be able to measure that, and you need to have the right kind of uh, framework to uh, to to look at that. The other aspect is, is that, you know, as part of our um, uh, ADB's uh, private sector operations, you know, between 2019 and 2024, our objective is, again, once again, to mobilize private capital, uh, targeting climate financing, gender equality, uh, as well as investing in less, our, of course, in the, the less developed countries, as well as new sectors by leveraging uh, innovative instruments. Gender and climate are very much at the core of the considerations as part of this. You know, for example, earlier um, last month, um, we had we invested as an anchor investor in a twenty million dollar green bond issued by the uh, Georgian Railway, which is a state-owned enterprise, uh, to support the improvement of existing lines as part of their ongoing modernization. 
Now, this was part of an overall greater $500 million issuance by the railway, and it was their first green bond issuance by a state-owned entity, uh, as well as a transport company in Georgia in the Southeast Caucasus, and it's now been listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange. So small examples like that, you know, this bond in particular was eight times oversubscribed uh, and it just demonstrates that there's significant appetite for well-structured and impactful instruments and bonds like that. Last night I was actually speaking with the CEO of the company and he was extremely delighted obviously with this outcome. And, and one of the things that he noted is that it had uh, attracted a lot of positive attention. And this, you know, you need to create uh, the positive stories, I think, which will uh, highlight, you know, the types of things that you can do within this market. And it also speaks about partnerships. Um, you know, one other aspect of this transaction was that it was also uh, gender focused so that we are looking at gender equality and where they have a gender action plan, which targets, you know, uh, improvements for the female workers and, and uh, passenger safety. So, you know, we're trying to raise awareness and looking at the SDGs uh, from a number of angles. And this, again, speaks to some of the comments already made about you're looking through your investments through the lens of, of the SDGs when you're actually making the investments from the very beginning. Um, one of the other aspects I also wanted to mention was that, you know, the pandemic has also exposed inequalities with regards to inadequacies of our health systems, but also other challenges with regards to access to education and increased food insecurity. And I think through this, what we're doing is we're trying to grow our footprint in sectors in these sectors which are reflective of this, such as health and education agribusiness, which again, focus on helping our, our developing member countries deliver on their, their SDGs. Um, and then since the start of the pandemic, um, our private sector operations response um, for direct healthcare financing has evolved through the pandemic. Uh, our commitments have, <clears throat> pardon me, have been made to support procurement and distribution of urgently needed medical supplies, uh, produce generic uh, medicines, provide working capital to ensure uh, continued hospital uh, service delivery, as well as supporting COVID-19 diagnostic services uh, to support pharmaceutical distribution and financing for cold chain for supply for vaccines. So we're looking at all kinds of different ways of trying to address the situation and the needs at the time. And uh, another aspect of this too is also we're looking at scaling up our agribusiness um, uh, investments by making, um, making those investments to help reduce hunger, promote more environmentally sustainable and inclusive business models. And, you know, I'll give you a few examples of that. And that includes, you know, helping cassava farmers in Bangladesh, chili farmers in India, flower farmers in Vietnam. So it's very wide ranging. Um, other, other, you know, aspects of that include uh, helping food security, safety standards, and security for dairy farms in, in some of the uh, other countries that we're supporting, including uh, the People's Republic of China. So, you know, we're working uh, with a number of different companies and the whole idea is that, you know, we want to help uh, uh, crowd in the private sector. We want to help, uh, uh, you know, create those right environments so that we can invest along these, along these lines. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Let me turn now to Ramesh Subramaniam, who's the Director General of ADB Southeast Asia Regional Department. As you noted, Suzanne, one of ADB's unique value adds on this agenda is its ability to engage both the public and private sector players in our region that create the environment for private investment that aligns with the SDGs. Ramesh, the DMCs that you work with increasingly recognize these opportunities, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the ways in which ADB is supporting them to enable the private sector to make investments that advance a green, resilient, and inclusive approach to development. Sure. Thank you so much, Smita. And uh, first of all, thank you and great appreciation to uh, your department strategy and policy department uh, for putting the series together, and this is the second in the series. Um, Emily, Nina, and Suzanne have already covered a very rich ground, uh, presenting insights on a lot of issues. Let me, uh, before I go into some of those concrete examples that you asked for, Smitha, let me uh, reinforce what uh, Suzanne said uh, in, in terms of uh, how SDGs have been evolving, particularly in Southeast Asia, but across Asia and the Pacific. Uh, even before the pandemic, as we know, based on the assessments that ADB has been involved in, for example, with UNSCAP, 
We did a study uh, about uh, three years back with the Economic Research Institute uh, for ASEAN, uh, which very clearly showed that the distance to SDGs was in fact becoming longer and longer even before the pandemic. Now, clearly with the pandemic, we know that the uh, impact on SDGs is actually pretty negative. Now, despite the uh, fairly large volume of funds, globally pools of resources that are available, uh, we do know that many countries, particularly in developing Asia, are uh, struggling. Uh, SDG targets are certainly being missed in general, uh, but within that, if you look at particularly climate change or climate finance related targets, which is something, an example that I would, an area that I would uh, focus on. Uh, and then here, if you particularly look at, for instance, the UN uh, Red Alert report that was released a few months back, very clearly shows that we are not even close uh, to uh, meeting uh, the Paris Agreement uh, targets. And clearly in the last 20 months since the uh, pandemic uh, started, uh, the impact has been getting certainly worse. And if you look at extreme poverty in terms of people being pushed into extreme poverty, um, estimates suggest that it could be as high as 70 uh, million people. And in within Asia and Pacific, the, that number could be also quite uh, considerable. Uh, now, one would think that conventional wisdom would state that uh, with the um, emerging markets performing reasonably well uh, and with low interest rates in high income countries, money would be coming into uh, the emerging markets and, and within that developing Asia. Now, if you look at, for instance, the institutional investors with funds, you know, over $90 trillion invested, if you look at uh, the uh, study done by ARENA in 2020, for instance, uh, the money that goes into, uh, if you take renewable energy, for instance, that's about 20% if it is indirectly going through funds. And if it is directly into project finance, it's less than 1%. And within that, if you come to Asia, and within that, if you come down further to Southeast Asia, these numbers become uh, quite small. Now, in this context, what is ADB doing? I'll just mention a few examples. Uh, first is obviously upstream uh, reforms, upstream policy, legal, regulatory, institutional environment is so critical. So the context of ADB uh, in the uh, sovereign operations or the regional departments, as we call, we work very closely with our private sector colleagues, with Suzanne and team, and also with our office of public-private partnership. In terms of creating that overall canvas, we have country partnership strategies where we mainstream SDG considerations, and then particularly we've been doing it in the post-pandemic, in the pandemic and the post-pandemic context particularly. Uh, now, if we then come from strategies into what we need to do in terms of investments, uh, clearly we do need to create um, explicit uh, pipeline of uh, bankable projects. Bankable is very, very critical. And here in this context, sovereign financing is not just money going into projects, uh, on its own, but it should also be um, leveraging resources in, in, a, in a catalytic manner. So in this regard, we are actually, or we have begun to look at sovereign financing as transition financing with private sector financing to come into the future. Now in this regard, let me talk about uh, an initiative that we have uh, within Southeast Asia called the Green and Innovative Finance Initiative uh, as part of uh, an innovation hub that was set up. And here we are looking, we are doing a few things. First is providing overall support at the regional level in Southeast Asia. We have the ASEAN Infrastructure Fund, uh, which was set up in 2011. Uh, two years ago in 2019, just before the pandemic hit, uh, we had set up an initiative called the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Initiative, uh, which has come in really handy. Uh, despite the pandemic, uh, the initiative has taken on uh, very well, and we have now 25 green projects in the uh, pipeline for ACG of the Catalytic Green Finance Facility. Uh, four projects have already been approved, uh, with these raising over $1.4 billion of uh, financing. And uh, if you look at impact, they'll be leading to over 150 tons, 150,000 tons, pardon me, of uh, CO2 reductions per year. Now, uh, we've also raised over $1.7 billion of uh, commitments and co-financing from a number of uh, global development partners. Uh, and uh, these will enable uh, us to uh, start a green recovery program, which is the first of its kind in uh, Asia uh, with support from the Green Climate Fund. Uh, the idea is that through these initiatives, we'll be leveraging at least 
uh, one uh, for, for six uh, in terms of private capital coming in, in uh, capital expenditures or operational expenditures uh, to over a period of uh, time. Uh, we've also set up an ASEAN Blue Hub uh, to complement these activities at the ACG, uh, the, uh, through the ACGF that I mentioned. Uh, and our second is country strategies and roadmaps. Uh, I mentioned what we are, uh, from ADB's point of view, Suzanne also talked about how our strategy 2030 uh, acts as an overall canvas, how all our country operation strategies come in. Uh, now, within that, we are helping countries come up with green strategies, of green recovery strategies and roadmaps, particularly for several countries, uh, through a series of reports uh, that we work with the Climate Bonds Initiative of the UK, called the Green uh, Infrastructure Investment Opportunities, or GIIO, that have been produced for Philippines, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and uh, CBI is producing this, or the GIIO is being produced for several countries. Third area is knowledge and capacity is going to be very, very critical. And here we've done a green recovery strategies book, uh, looking at what is the pathway uh, in ASEAN. And particularly we asked the question, like in Europe, is there any possibility for having a green deal? Is there, is there even something you know, that, that, that we can start thinking about? And we are beginning to articulate that in the green recovery strategies book. And last week, we uh, issued a, uh, an SDG bonds uh, book um, at, at a World Economic Forum uh, event. And finally, country level green projects. We have a uh, pretty exciting project in Indonesia called the SDG One Indonesia Green Facility. Um, and we have in the Philippines, for instance, sustainable finance projects which are coming. And finally, uh, on capital markets in terms of support that we are providing through the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum, we have helped them develop green uh, social and sustainability bond standards. And as of March uh, 2021, uh, ASEAN has issued over $10 billion worth of bonds um, and including 6.5 billion in local currency uh, issuances. And looking ahead, we'll be working with ACMF closely in, um, in coming up with transition bond standards, particularly with focus on high carbon emitting industries uh, to transition to low carbon uh, pathways. Uh, and, and finally, we are also in Thailand last year, in the height of the pandemic, in fact, we helped uh, issue, the, the Thai public debt management office issue over $1 billion worth of bonds to finance green infrastructure projects, uh, as well as the state-owned National Housing Authority. And in Indonesia, the electricity utility PLN is on the verge of issuing its first uh, green bonds for $500 million. And later, I'll come back to some of the points that Suzanne mentioned in terms of other sectors. Thank you, Smita. Back to you. Thanks so much, Ramesh. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists for that opening set of reflections on how we're responding to this challenge and opportunity in our, in our various institutional capacities and, and the drivers of, of, of those efforts. Um, I want to turn now to the audience um, for a little bit of their reflections um, on which SDG areas they think present the greatest opportunities for ADB to collaborate with private investors. You've heard a little bit about where the emphasis has been um, to date, um, but you should see a polling question um, popping up in front of you now. Um, and we'd love to hear from you on where you see the opportunity space looking ahead before we turn back to our panelists about the road ahead, um, recognizing that we have much more to go, um, much more to do uh, in order to achieve these ambitions. So consistent with what we've heard from our prior speakers about the existential challenge that climate change presents for our planet and for our region, we see a strong uh, emphasis on the need for ADB to continue to deepen engagement with private players around climate action, um, but also a recognition of the role that infrastructure um, plays, this having been a mainstay um, of our lending portfolio um, and, and, and an area where we really need to deepen emphasis on green, inclusive, and resilient approaches. Um, so with those audience perspectives in mind, let me turn back to Emily um, for your reflections on where you see the greatest potential um, on this agenda for our region and roles for ADB as a multilateral in particular in this regard. Absolutely. Um, I did write my master's thesis on pretty much this exact question in 2018, so I'll try and distill that into the couple of minutes that I've got. Um, I'll start with the opportunities. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, some estimates around the opportunities of the SDGs sort of fall within around five to seven trillion dollars a year globally um, of investment that's needed, of which around two to two and a half is estimated to be needed in Asia. Um, and that's across everything from education, health, infrastructure um, and climate change mitigation and adaptation. So because BlackRock is, is, is quite focused on climate change, um, in particular at the moment, um, 
if we think about the fact that we just had a, a whole raft of net zero commitments globally in the last year in particular, 70% of Asia's GDP is now covered by ambitious net zero targets. Um, and the majority of the top 10 carbon emitters in the MSCI Acquia are actually based in Asia. Um, and that conversation is a, is a little bit more nascent in Asia, but also that's where we see the greatest opportunity. And those kind of fall into both physical and transition related opportunities. Um, if you think about APAC in particular, more adversely impacted by physical risk, um, and that's going to probably intensify in APAC over the coming years. So companies that are providing solutions to that issue will be, with, through their business models, will be opportunities um, in this part of the world for, from an investment perspective. Um, then if we think about the transition side of things, well, the energy transition is a multi-decade and far-reaching trend that will have a profound impact on almost every aspect of how we will do business. Um, and so this will play out over the next 30 years, but it will be most acute in the next 10 years. Um, Asia has a really unique opportunity to leapfrog some of the technologies that will be a part of that transition. And so that's gonna throw out investment opportunities in, in, in many different areas across energy, mobility, industrial, the built environment, agricultural solutions, forestry, that, I could go on and on, but, but, but you get the picture. Um, if I think about the role for multilaterals and how they can play in that process, there's, there's, a, there's a few different ways, but I'll, I'll, I'll distill it to two main aspects. And first is using their capability and influence to help the development of the financial ecosystem to facilitate this shift. And then secondly, in terms of how they're actually investing themselves. Um, and some of this echoes what, what Ramesh was talking about already. Um, so if we think about what makes a financial system kind of successful when it comes to impact finance you know you think about the role of governments and how critical that is you think about the role of disclosure and how critical that is but it's also really important to have proper institutional frameworks and your intermediaries nearly really need to have the capability and the expertise to facilitate that so that is things like industry networks and associations collaborative action on research and education and knowledge sharing and leadership by key influential entities such as the multilateral development banks so that's kind of the first aspect where we can where we can really impact but then there's also the actual funding um which um there's a few different ways but um i personally would like to just focus on the concept of blended finance um there's a huge green in investment opportunity in asia but because it's a little bit nascent blended finance has the potential to play a really big role in the development of, of that market um, to try and strengthen that nexus between ESG goals and profitability. Um, and, you know, it can help address a number of market failures, you know, that multilateral development banks can, can bring in different tools such as grants, guarantees, insurance, first loss commitments, below market funding rates, other kind of de-risking or mechanisms such as technical assistance to enhance project viability. And what that will end up doing is helping us crowd in other private investment to actually really help us scale either early stage projects or businesses or technologies or, or ones that are struggling to find capital elsewhere. Um, and there are, there are considerations around that in terms of how we can streamline that process and make it more standardized to make that, actual, that whole process a lot more um, smooth and um, scalable across the whole market. So that would probably be my one main ask, but there's there's lots of different ways in which we can all collaborate together. And I, I'll stop there, otherwise I'll go on all day. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, a great set of observations about ways in which we can we can do more. And I think as ADB, we recognize the need to continue to push ourselves to, to do more on this agenda. So let me turn now to Suzanne um, again for her views on how ADB can further strengthen its approach to private investment in the SDGs and our comparative advantages on these agendas. No, again, you know, I've been really enjoying the, the uh, discussion so far and some of the issues that have been brought up. And I think that, you know, you can see some sort of commonality which is going around uh, that. And I think that, you know, one of the issues that was brought up before was that, you know, one of the challenges about mobilizing private capital is the need for common metrics to measure impact. Um, and I think that, you know, issues of, of standardization is one that I think is essential to help uh, push this, uh, uh, you know, not agenda, I would say, but, but, but push, you know, this, the importance of this topic and stuff. So clear, clear standards help mobilize uh, uh, capital, you know, along SDG aligned investments. 
as it facilitates harmonization, you know, transparency, as well as accountability, and a proper framework with appropriate definitions and taxonomy would enhance market clarity, build uh, uh, investor confidence, and, and facilitate measurement and um, uh, tracking. So there's a number of things that, that are needed because financial markets, as we know, like to have clear, comprehensive, and high quality information so that they can make proper decisions. Um, you know, we've mentioned uh, a little bit about uh, blended finance. Uh, I think that <clears throat> that's an important tool in our toolbox uh, to, you know, to, to crowd in the private sector. You know, again, we've heard, uh, you know, Emily was just mentioning about some of the aims, you know, one of the things that we're very conscious of in that is that we don't want to be, you know, distortionary in the market. And I think that we need to be very careful how we use those funds and be, you know, again, very structured in, in, in the fact that they're de-risking um, the actual uh, investments so that you can crowd in the private sector. So again, it's a powerful tool, but we need to care, use very, you know, use it very carefully. Um, you know, ADB has been very, uh, you know, successful, I guess you could say, in raising donor monies uh, from the private sector side. We've got around $900 million that, you know, we've, we have uh, where we're using uh, for blended finance. And I think it's this, you know, ability to bring in uh, private capital. So from a, from a mobilization point of view, you know, we've been able to bring in, you know, $13 for every dollar that we're investing. So that's a pretty high ratio. And again, it's one of those abilities to, pry, you know, uh, crowd in the private sector. And, and you know, when you're thinking about, um, uh, you know, limitations, advantages, and that kind of thing, yeah. What is important is that you need to take a little bit more targeted approach to certain aspects of the SDGs, in particular, when we're looking at uh, new uh, solutions and stuff. Uh, we've uh, launched recently last year was the ADB Venture Capitals Facility. And through that, you know, what we want to try and do is invest in uh, early stage uh, companies that are developing uh, technologies that help achieve the SDGs. And again, you know, this is something, you know, we have an inaugural fund, which is raised for some $60 million. And the whole idea is to invest in uh, uh, those uh, companies that, again, are at early stage, focusing on technology, focusing on clean technology and agriculture, where there is a, a unique ability there to um, uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, I would say higher risk capital, but also crowd in uh, uh, private sector, but also to encourage those those ideas of innovation. And I think that that is is a really really powerful tool. We've already made, uh, even though this uh, fund was launched last year, we've made a number of investments, including in clean energy, um, involving you know uh, remote vehicles. Uh, we have a number of other uh, fintech investments that we're making, um, and the whole idea of that, <clears throat> like I said, is to actually focus in on the on the taking advantage of the tech area, tech area, which is really important now, as we've seen uh, through this uh, race, recent pandemic, how important to have appropriate technology is, uh, is you know, suitable for your clients. So we're also looking to, to increase and, and raise uh, um, uh, another fund as a consequence of this, uh, again, to focus on climate impact uh, and focus on clean energy. So, <clears throat> Pardon me. With that, uh, just a you know a quick word on talking about you know small island and fragile states and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, blended finance once again has been a key aspect of that to do risk to bring uh, uh, you know private sector into these particular investments. We have uh, last year we launched a private sector window under our Asian Development Fund. And again, uh, it's to remote, promote uh, private sector growth and investment in ADB's poorest uh, and most vulnerable countries um, with an objective again to, to uh, align those investments with um, uh, blended finance and that would not necessarily uh, immediately uh, um, uh, proceed on a, on a purely commercial basis. So, you know, through that, you know, we've been looking at developing different financing solutions. Um, and, and through that, uh, we also, uh, with ADB as a uh, multilateral development bank, I think we have a, an ability to work with uh, our partners, work with uh, governments and development mem member countries to, to come up with a common framework to deliver on the SDGs. Um, and uh, part of our role there is to, to leverage private capital within that. So, um, 
Uh, very interesting, great discussion. And so thank you. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Um, let me turn to Ramesh now for a complimentary perspective um, on how our engagement with the public sector can help create deeper private partnerships that enable the investment that we need. Thank you, Smita. Uh, before that, the poll that you posted also prompt, prompted me to mention, you know, we need to look at the labor market impacts of the pandemic, which is going to be very, very critical. And particularly within that, uh, the gender impact of uh, the pandemic is also going to be critical. Tourism sector is something that has been devastated. Investments need to go back in. And uh, there is certainly, you know, there are SDG linkages there that, uh, that we need to look at as well. On, on what you asked, uh, Smita, uh, and what Emily mentioned, uh, Emily, your ask is also our wish. We, we certainly want to align ourselves very closely. Let me mention five concrete areas. I'll, I'll do this very quickly in four minutes. Uh, the first area is uh, the need for uh, financing for small and medium enterprises. Uh, SMEs have been, again, you know, needless to say, devastated uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, we, we are now looking at a, a very uh, interesting initiative uh, for which we are partnering with MasterCard International and uh, NFRANCE in the fintech space, uh, particularly focused on MSME uh, recovery. Uh, this is a, a small pilot initiative. We are looking at uh, setting up a liquidity and credit facility to over 5,000 micro and small and medium sized enterprises in one part of Indonesia in Bondung. We want to learn from it and if we can replicate it, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the uh, setting up an ecosystem. Uh, second point is on clean and green investments. I already gave the example of ACGF, uh, what we are doing. Let me mention two specific initiatives. Uh, one is a renewable energy platform for ASEAN called Assure. Uh, it's ASEAN scaling up renewable energy and storage. Uh, this program brings together TA, uh, transaction advisory, as well as public and private sector financing from ADB, as well as uh, others. Focus on uh, issues, uh, uh, investment opportunities uh, in renewable energy generation, uh, as well as uh, storage. Uh, second initiative here is, is quite exciting, uh, called the Energy Transition Mechanism, or ETM for short. Basically, it's busting coal plants, uh, but political economy is going to be quite complex, so we are taking our time. We are looking at three countries, Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam, uh, and in fact, we are working with Emily's uh, team in, in terms of identifying opportunities, as well as with other uh, partners as well. Uh, now, third area I wanted to focus on uh, goes to what Naina has been talking about. How can we work, how can we leverage concessional and philanthropic capital to de-risk project? This is a point that Emily mentioned as well. Uh, now here, through the vehicles that I mentioned, how can ADB act as a channel for leveraging uh, resources? Um, and, and it's not, you know, it's innovatively using the funds, but not always as grants. The blended finance principles that uh, Emily mentioned is going to be very critical. We have minimum concessionality uh, principles that we look at and, uh, you know, focus on most challenging sectors, amber or red sectors, you know, look at urban transport, for instance, or things like energy distribution, where, where we do need to uh, bring in resources. Uh, the blue finance example that I mentioned would be quite ideal to ramp up support uh, for this, as well as the uh, energy transition mechanism. Fourth idea is uh, on uh, deepening debt markets, particularly green uh, and sustainable capital markets. Uh, I mentioned SDG bonds publication, the knowledge product that we uh, uh, released last week. But within that, there is an innovative idea called the SDG accelerator bond, which is actually going to what Emily mentioned in terms of how can we staple guarantees or guarantee-like instruments to uh, some of the riskiest projects uh, or, or bonds that are attached to some of the riskiest projects uh, so, so that we can leverage financing from the markets. And finally, fifth area, this is super important for uh, particularly ASEAN. Uh, given the spate of natural disasters that uh, particularly countries like Indonesia and Philippines have been going through, Vietnam, Cambodia, is what is it that we can do for disaster risk financing, uh, disaster insurance, and whatever we can do in terms of promoting innovation uh, in, in finance and coming up with financial instruments for risk transfer. Uh, that's an area that we are working on, particularly in the Philippines, uh, we are working on a, a pretty novel parametric disaster insurance scheme to protect uh, Philippine cities against uh, damages and losses from uh, catastrophes like earthquakes and typhoons. 
So this is going into SDG uh, 11. And we are working with other countries as well in the uh, region, including uh, Indonesia, ASEAN wide, there is a facility which we are uh, partnering. Uh, and, and finally, the other areas, you know, in the interest of time, not going into some of the other sectors, which is so critical, education, health, needless to say, uh, particularly in the post pandemic context, we've been so far, you know, obviously all the resources have been allocated to um, the, the pandemic uh, impact, but clearly there are whole host of non-communicable disease burden or diseases which have always been there. And because now what has happened in the last two years, we do need to kind of get back in terms of providing more support uh, for uh, health burden in, in, in uh, those sorts of areas as well. Education, again, particularly, and if you look at technical and vocational education in terms of rebuilding skills back, going to be very critical. Those are some of the thoughts, uh, Smita. Let me pause there. Thanks a lot for those reflections, Ramesh. Lots to be done, clearly. Um, let me turn to Naina for a final set of observations on what, from her perspective, with the investors that are in her network, she sees as the greatest challenges when it comes to scaling funds to maximize impact on the SDGs in our region um, and opportunities for multilaterals like ourselves to help address these challenges. Uh, thanks, Mita. So I think it's been really interesting to um, actually hear all of you speak about you know the different projects and uh, and instruments that are coming on on board because that's exactly what i hear from the market is you know we need blended finance we need to be able to de-risk some of these early early stage investments we need to be investing in innovation we need to be investing in scaling some of the uh, enterprises in the areas that have the greatest amount of need i think um, you know both uh, both suzanne and ramesh uh, touched on a number of initiatives that the adb is already doing my my thing would actually be you know something that i think emily touched on briefly which is on the education and awareness building i mean as a multilateral and working with governments in you know across the asian region um, really looking at education especially for financial advisors and asset advisors um, you know it's that's that's really key and that gets left behind a lot because you do have a lot of investors a lot of family offices that are interested in putting in the SDGs in their portfolio, but not understanding a metric how to measure, you know, SDG impact along with financial returns is a reason that oftentimes asset managers, financial advisors don't do it. The other one is not really having as much knowledge and awareness of the different types of instruments and bonds that you all talked about today that, that are available and that should be there for private sector investment to be crowded in. So I think that's that's something else which is, which is very key. And the third point that I'll actually bring in here is is to really use the influence that multilateral banks like the ADB have with the with institutions, with bourses, in terms of actually making some of this, uh, you know, making some of the SDG metrics mandatory, making some of the disclosure in terms of SDG impact that is being achieved mandatory, which actually helps investors then realize what it is, what is it that they are investing in. We've seen a lot of um, increase in uptake in ESG investing after, after uh, sort of uh, monetary authorities have made it much more uh, a requirement for uh, for organizations to state where they are on on ESG metrics. Doing the same with SDGs will also actually increase the uptake on investments, keeping an SDG lens in in mind. I mean, finally, I, I would say you know, looking at some of the underfunded areas, you know, like. Um, non-communicable diseases, looking at disaster, some of which don't really get as much um, sort of their place in the sun as some of the green uh, instruments or even the blue portfolios that is now becoming much more popular. I think those are the things that, uh, that ADB can actually really push through for other investors to come in. I'm going to stop here because I know we're running out of time. Many thanks to all of our panelists for those thoughtful reflections um, on a challenging agenda. Um, let me turn now to Ashok Lavaza, who's ADB's Vice President for Private Sector Operations and Public-Private Partnerships for some closing remarks and reflections um, on behalf of ADB Senior Management. Thank you, Smita, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I think this has been a most fascinating discussion uh, and very rich uh, in content and sweep, uh, even though the time was very short. So let me thank the panelists for their practical insights into the ongoing efforts to steer private finance towards SDGs and the challenges in uh, closing the investment gap that exists between goals and resources required 
in achieving them. I think the panelists have touched upon uh, the drivers of the growing focus on sustainable investment, the opportunities in the Asia Pacific region to mainstream sustainability concerns, ADB's approach uh, in mobilizing private finance for SDGs, and the role of uh, public sector action and incentives to enable private investment in the SDGs. Uh, and here I would <clears throat> say that uh, what Emily said about the cusp of sustainability and the tectonic shift towards sustainability, I think these two uh, statements are very important to describe where we are and where we ought to go. Uh, I think all the panelists have highlighted the environment which is required to make sustainable investments conducive, the role of the governments, the role of multilateral institutions, the role of innovation, innovative financing, and public policy mandates. I think all those things have been very adequately brought out, including uh, giving examples of some of the initiatives that have been taken. Now, uh, as uh, it was mentioned by several speakers that the attainment of SDGs by 2030, it was ambitious target in itself. And it has been made more challenging by the pandemic that has not only stunted the growth momentum of global economy, it has significantly retarded it. Quite expectedly, it has affected the poorer and vulnerable countries the most. Uh, as per ADB estimates, the GDP of developing Asia and the Pacific has contracted by 6 to 9.5% in 2020, compared with pre-COVID levels. And global economic losses uh, could reach 4.8 to $7.4 trillion in 2020, with developing Asia accounting for about 28%. By the end of 2020, as Ramesh pointed out, the crisis has already pushed seven, about 78 million more people below the $1.9 a day poverty line. With sustainable development at our core, ADB in partnership with both public and private sector is committed to supporting developing member countries' transformative pathways to rebuild economies, to restore livelihoods, and recover from the pandemic. As multilateral development banks and development financial institutions actively work to close the estimated investment gap, private sector interventions to source finance need to be leveraged by innovative mechanisms. Channeling funds from the private sector into achieving the SDGs seems constrained by lack of adequate incentives and investments common definitions and standards, harmonious partnerships, and inadequate monitoring and evaluating methods for assessing the progress of implementation. And I think this point has been made more than once by more than one speaker. There is a need for a reliable set of measurable indicators to support the private sector in measuring implementation progress. Private firms have advanced significantly in their risk assessments, increasing increasingly accounting for the environmental, social, and governance aspects of projects and fostering more realistic risk scenarios and understanding the long-term economic impacts of funding projects that support the sustainability agenda. However, additional capital needs to flow into areas that address the risks appropriately. These private sector investors can contribute widely from policy-driven solutions to voluntary investments. Through a continued expansion of ADB's private sector operations under Strategy 2030, ADB seeks development impact while ensuring profitability and commercial sustainability. As my colleagues have discussed, key priorities include supporting ambitious Paris-aligned climate action through investment in low carbon infrastructure and promoting gender equality. At the same time, we are scaling up our investments in private sector initiatives that are extending access to healthcare and education and restoring food security and essential supply chains, which have been disrupted by the pandemic. 
We are experimenting with new approaches to unlocking investments that will help protect and restore marine and other ecosystems, including ADB's first blue loan to boost plastic recycling in Asia. Through donor-supported facilities such as the ADF private sector window, something that Susan talked about, that leverages concessional financing to improve commercial viability, ADB supports private sector investment that advances the SDGs in our region's poorest countries and those affected by fragility and conflict. As my colleagues noted, we are targeting key enablers of the SDGs, such as digital transformation, through initiatives such as ADB Ventures that provide a springboard for developing Asia to leapfrog towards its SDG goals with many high impact tech enabled cross-cutting solutions. A unique feature of ADB's approach is that we work with both public and private sector players. The challenge before us is to support our DMC clients to put in place the policies, regulations, and incentives that will catalyze the financing need to realize the SDGs and help governments make the best choices to attract private sector investment. As earlier mentioned, we are exploring innovative approaches, something that Ramesh highlighted, the five initiatives, such as ADB's new SDG accelerator bond approach, supported through the ASEAN Catalytic Green Financing Facility. These initiatives aim to incentivize DMC clients to achieve SDG targets faster with cheaper funds in the initial period to support SDG impacting projects. A key element of our approach is to support public-private partnerships that deliver high quality services for those who need them most while harnessing the efficiency, the innovation, and the capacity of the private sector. Through initiatives such as the Asia Pacific Project Preparation Facility, which have mobilized $1 billion of private capital over the past five years into sustainable and inclusive infrastructure projects in our region, ADB continues to provide financial and technical assistance to partner governments to help prepare and structure projects that will effectively attract private sector participation and investment. For example, in the Pacific, AP3F provided catalytic project preparation to the first utility scale project, uh, solar project in Palau, which recently achieved commercial closure. As PPP transaction advisor, ADB is supporting Palau to deliver the first IPP in the Pacific using an integrated solar battery system, which will supply 25% of the island's power needs. ADB is also working to better the needs of our clients and countries through a wider range of more tailored financial offerings, integrated solutions, and new partnerships. We are expanding our presence across Asia and the Pacific through strengthened private sector expertise in our resident missions and a new office in Singapore that will foster regional collaboration, strategic partnerships, knowledge sharing, and structuring and mobilization of innovative, sustainable investments. The sweeping effects of the pandemic in our region have been sobering, something which the panelists brought out very prominently. But the sustained interest amongst diverse private stakeholders, including our panelists today, in investments that advance environmental, social, and governance considerations is a source of hope. The growing focus on the SDGs, I think, holds the promise of providing these players with a common framework and language around which to orient a wide range of investment strategies and approaches. The question of how to define, measure, and monitor impact when it comes to SDGs remains a critical issue. ADB has aligned its own results management systems and reportings with the SDGs. 
as has been noted, we are implementing the X anti development impact framework, which will help to quantify and optimize development impact across projects and also on a portfolio basis. We are actively engaging the growing set of players seeking to form and form new standards for SDG aligned investment, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. I think I've spoken enough. Thank you very much once again for your participation in the second SDG dialogue and your thoughtful reflections on these challenging issues as we march forward towards the world's shared vision for sustainable development. ADB is committed to leading the region's smart, green, and inclusive recovery out of the pandemic and achieving a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. I thank you for the opportunity for sharing my views with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky Lavaza, and again to all of our panelists for their time and insight, and to all of you for making time to join us um, for this discussion. Um, as I mentioned, this is the second of our SDG dialogue series, and the next one will focus on a topic that was actually quite dominant in today's session, the question of impact measurement around the SDGs. So we hope you'll join us for that session as well. In the meantime, thank you again, and a good day. <laughs>